Hello, good evening and welcome. My name is Alex. I'm the chair of the Council of Christians and Jews in Victoria and welcome to this special event um, where we'll be learning about the ICCJ and a little bit about the ACCJ. And if you don't know what those acronyms mean, you'll soon find out. Um, let us be. Let me begin by welcoming everyone and acknowledging that um, in Australia, we're on the lands of the Indigenous peoples, wherever we may be across the country, um, and this, this land was never ceded. Um, I feel it's important to always acknowledge that um, so that we remember always where we come from and where we're going. Um, I think in this particular case, um, we'll be hearing a lot about where we've come from um, when we, our special guest um, tells us about the ICCJ and the things that uh, are happening between um, in interfaith dialogue across the world um, and more broadly across uh, Australia as well, in later in conversation with the ACCJ president, Ron Honig. But firstly, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest, Lillian Apotheka, who's been the um, president of the ICCJ since 2021. Um, she's originally from uh, Belgium. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she speaks five languages at least um, and, and uh, is very well renowned in the um, interfaith uh, world but she'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, but for now, um, it's my pleasure to hand over to Lillian and she can tell you more about herself and about the ICCJ. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you all for organizing this event. Uh, I feel very privileged to be able to reach out to you uh, to the antipodes, as my friend Michael Trenner, who's also vice president of the ICCJ, never fails to mention. And it's a privilege to see you and be with you uh, this evening for you, this morning for me in Paris. We at ICCJ value the work that you do very much. And every time you mention the First Nations, uh, in every email that you sent, is something that alerts us to um, a history and a situation that we don't know much about and we need to be alerted to. Uh, let me tell you briefly how and why I became involved in Jewish-Christian dialogue and the wider interfaith movement. I, um, I was born in Belgium. Uh, my parents were Holocaust survivors. I always felt that I wanted to say who I am, wanted to be able to say out loud that I'm Jewish, uh, but um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, that was not such an easy thing to do. Um, when my kids were born, we moved from Belgium to France, and I lived in a very Catholic suburb of Paris where I sensed that there was a huge interest for what it meant to be Jewish. There were not many interlocutors, Jewish interlocutors. We were a very small group from different backgrounds. Uh, most of the Jews in France were from, today are from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria. I brought a very different background and history to this. And the city I lived in, that suburb, organized uh, um, a Bible exhibition. And I was invited to the organizing committee of that Bible exhibition. I was the only Jew. There were about 50 Protestants and 50 Catholics there. And the Jewish fact, the Jewish identity was not, a, I'm, I'm not saying it was not important because I got invited, but it was a big question mark, a void. So 
the opening scenes of that event were, I'm giving you an example, the Bible, the book of all Christians. And to me, that was very unsettling. How do I bring to this crowd that was full of goodwill the notion that the Bible was also my book and even, uh, I would say, my book first, not that I claim exclusive possession of this, but the question of the origin mattered. And organizing this event took a year. The meetings between us made everybody move from their original positions. That was very hard work, very often unsettling to me. But I also felt that it was uh, an opportunity for self-development for myself. And it enriched me in a way uh, nothing else did. And I, by becoming interreligious, I experienced a growth of my spiritual self, a better understanding of my own religion, of where I came from. And um, that development of self coincided with the development of Jewish-Christian dialogue in France. Let me give you another example, and then we'll move <laughs> to different perspectives. But when I started, it was the big controversy about there being a convent of Carmelites in Auschwitz with a huge cross on the site of Auschwitz. When we talked about this between Jews and Christians, there was very little understanding on the Christian part of what the Jewish position on this could be. To us, a cross in Auschwitz was impossible. To the Christians I was in dialogue with, there was a, a, an impossibility to understand where my issue was with Carmelites praying there. And I had to ask questions like, who are they praying for? For the victims and the perpetrators? And the answers to these questions sort of brought us deeper into many, you know, what does remembrance mean? What does prayer mean? Uh, how do you pray for somebody else? What does it mean to in pray for another person? What kind of intrusion into that other person's life and history does that represent? Very deep questions. And I would say these questions are addressed very differently today than they were uh, 30 years ago, I can't believe it's that long ago now. I haven't seen time pass, but I've seen the evolution and the steps forward. And that is tremendous, I think. Um, this this uh, Jewish-Christian dialogue also brought me to questioning myself with what do I do with the memory and the remembrance of my own family history and the Jewish people history? And do, do I remain stuck at that? And I'm happy to explain what I mean with that. Or does it help me open up to other victims of history? Uh, which is also something I have a very specific memory of. I was invited once to be a speaker alongside a woman who was uh, escaped the Khmer Rouge, the Red Khmers, and all her family had been murdered. And she was in France 
and we both were asked to bear witness together to our family stories and how we address that. Uh, that was also um, a very a transformational occasion for me. Uh, and I, I didn't let go of anything, but I understood what part and how that suffer, suffering can be shared with others who are also victims of history. I want to add, and this is still part of me introducing myself, I am and I remain a grassroots person. I didn't study theology, never. <laughs> I've, uh, and I, I think I'm, being a grassroots person, I bring a vulnerability to what I do uh, that, that, and I'm not disparaging theologians or whoever, but people who bring uh, the, the weight and knowledge of academics discuss academic matters. When I'm in front of a crowd, I'm a Jewish person engaging in dialogue. Sometimes that brings about uh, anti-Semitic reactions of tremendous violence. And I've experienced that. I have to say uh, the, the pain in experiencing that is often made worse by the fact that I often have to react alone, even though there are, I don't know how many people in the room who probably feel a solidarity with me, but somehow Jewish people always have to fend for themselves in situations like that. And I think that that is something that we Jews and Christians need to address together. This is, as somebody said the other day, anti-Semitism is not a problem of the Jews, but it's a problem for the Jews. Uh, and, and, and that has to be addressed. And I'll come back to anti-Semitism later in the conversation. I'd like to say a few words about ICCJ <clears throat> now, more than a few words. ICCJ is the acronym of the International Council of Christians and Jews. Uh, it's an umbrella organization of about 36 member organizations in the world. Uh, like the ACC, we have organizations in Latin America, <laughs> in North America, in Europe, of course. Uh, and in Israel, um, we were, the foundational event of ICCJ was the Zenisberg Conference in 1947. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Zenisberg Conference, I suggest you check on the internet, but I'll tell you briefly, it was an emergency conference on anti-Semitism in 47. We need to connect our brains to what that means uh, in 47, two years after the Shoah, in a small town in Switzerland, Selisberg, where Jewish and Christian theologians gathered and uh, reflected on how to move forward and produced a document, uh, the 10 points of Zelisberg, which was largely based on the thesis of Julie Zak, a French uh, secular Jewish historian uh, <clears throat> who whose wife and daughter died in deportation and who nevertheless, while in hiding, 
And during the war, started writing an opus of work examining historically what the gospel really says and where Jesus and Israel really stand. And if you look at his work and has his and at his book, it it in French I would say it hasn't taken on wrinkles. It's still very relevant today. Uh, the, the, the 10 points of Zelisper compelled the ICCJ as an organization to produce a document called the 12 points of Berlin. I'll mention that a bit later, a time for recommitment which is a very good example of how, how ICCJ views its work and mission. We work with a tradition of thought and recommit to that tradition, always trying to include uh, current perspectives, issues, and how the dialogue may have changed through the advancement of theology, the work of academics, historians, and so on. As I've mentioned, we are the umbrella of the member organizations, which means that we exist through, by, and for you all, our member organizations. Uh, the ICCJ is basically uh, our executive board, uh, of which Michael Trenner is vice president. Uh, we are a very small group, five people plus a treasurer and a president. Um, and we're a hardworking group. Uh, whoever thinks it's about prestige or glamour, is completely mistaken. It's a lot, of, a lot about, not gonna say blood, sweat and tears, but hard work, toil, trying to find orientations that bring us together, trying to always move forward the best we can, knowing that there is inertia inherent to everything we do think, not us as executive board, but the member organizations, the groups, the churches, Judaism in its very uh, diverse streams. And there are challenges and tremendous strength to being international because every perspective is different. Jewish-Christian dialogue in Germany is very different from what it is in France or in the UK with its more multicultural perspective or in Scandinavia where there are hardly any Jews left or in Spain with the post-inquisition perspective or in Eastern Europe with the post-communist perspective and now the war in Ukraine. Uh, Italy, where the Jewish community lives one mile across from the Vatican and shares an ancient and, and how shall I say, rich but also difficult history with the church. Um, the migrant crisis all over Europe, uh, which will no doubt increase with the uh, environmental crisis, but also with what happens across the Mediterranean, which brings a lot of people to Europe and the war in the Ukraine. <laughs> the changes in demography everywhere, uh, also in the churches, uh, uh, the, the French Catholic Church, for instance, uh, nowadays, uh, because they're, they're, how shall I say, the, the number of people who want to become priests is diminishing 
they rely more and more on migrants from African countries previously colonized, missionized with pre-Vatican II and uh, the Leuenberg document. So they bring completely different perspectives to the teachings of the church today uh, that we all have to live with and deal with. Uh, all of this is, is uh, it, it demands our attention and our work. We need to be sensitive to all these issues and see how we integrate that. In, in our documents, in, in the themes that we address in our work in general. I, I would suggest uh, to all of you, if you have interest uh, in the work of the ICCJ, that you look at the documents that you can find online, the 12 points of Berlin, the mission statement of ICCJ, which you will see, though it, it takes Jewish-Christian dialogue as the basis of it, its work, but it's a very humanist mission statement because it addresses racism, uh, all forms of prejudice, and it compels us to work against all of these forms of prejudice not dropping the Jewish Christian conversation, but taking it as a starting point. What are the press, pressing issues today? Um, I think I've, I've addressed some of them in describing the situation. I, I would like to say that uh, anti-Semitism is to me, a matter of growing concern uh, because as uh, to speak in uh, terms that we are all familiar with now, it's a virus with many variants. It's present, it's spreading, and we don't have a vaccine against that. And we don't have medication against that. The only thing we can do is work together against it and not Jews alone against it. Um, let me say that I believe that so much about other forms of hatred and prejudice are, are, are extensions of what anti-Semitism really is. The fact that you cannot agree to the existence of the other, of the person who is different. And if we don't manage to combat that, we will not be able to com combat other forms of prejudice and hatred. I, I feel strongly about this, but I, I feel that it's wrong to say, oh, anti-Semitism is okay, the Jews are strong, <laughs> they can fight for themselves, and they have a country now, and look what they're doing in that country. And, and you know, there is a rise of conspiracy theories that is exponential because of new technologies. What used to be said in private conversation in cafes or whatever is now all over the internet and is, uh, it, it resonates in echo chambers that we don't know how to penetrate. And we don't resonate in echo chambers to the same extent. We're a very small group. So I, I find that uh, that is 
um, a matter of great concern. And I, I'd like to stress that that trajectory from the particular to the universal, from Judaism to opening up to the wider world, which is how I see uh, par paragraph four of Nostra Aetate, but also the Leuenberg document of the Protestant churches, the churches in Israel. Uh, it's, it's that trajectory is a powerful tool against a form of universalism that is in fact totalitarian. You know, so many people want everybody to drop their differences and then the world will be a peaceful place. Uh, I don't believe for one minute that this is uh, a, a, an ideology that will set us free. Quite the contrary, I think that addressing the singularity of every religion, community, uh, group, and from there opening up is what will set us free, not the not the opposite. And let me first um, take the opportunity yes. to thank Lillian for, for um, agreeing to participate in this, especially since we know it's early for, for you and it's late for us. Um, I also want to thank you because we, um, uh, myself, um, Jenny Chalmers, who's on the call, Ron Honig, and Michael Trainer, who's who's not available tonight. Um, we all met mm -hmm. Lillian in 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 Frankfurt in June, um, and so we've been um, trying to make this happen since then. So thank you, Lillian, for agreeing to to participate. Thanks. And on that note, as you said, let me pass on to Ron, who's the president of the Australian Council of of Christians and Jews, our umbrella organisation. Um, and I'll let um, Ron uh, facilitate the Q and A section. Thank you, Alex, and thank you very much, Lillian, for a, both a very personal uh, and a very um, a clear exposition of the kinds of concerns that the uh, ICCJ mm -hmm. is dealing with. And I, it, it sounds to me as if your major priority at the moment is working on anti-Semitism. And is, is, is mm -hmm. that the case or how, what, what are the, formulated priorities of the ICCJ? Um, that it's not a formulated priority, but when I, um, when I think about the events we're organizing for this year, let me share that with you, because I think uh, that's of interest to you and hopefully uh, you you will find it interesting enough to commit to participate in person and online. We, um, you know that the ICCJ holds two main events every year. One is a consultation and one is an international conference. The consultation is meant to deal with an issue inviting experts to examine that issue and then write a short paper as an orientation or a result for the member organizations <laughs> or whoever has interest in it. The conference is an international conference, an opportunity for all our member organizations to come together <laughs> meet, interact, and work on a specific theme. Um, since COVID, the consultation has been held online. And we find that for consultation, it's very opportune, very good to be online because it allows us to gather experts from all over the world. Whereas if we are in one geographical spot, we get the local experts mainly, 
and the member organizations that agreed to travel. Uh, the conference is different. It's a different type of event. The conference is open to everybody who wants to participate. The consultation is for the member organization, organizations and invited experts. For this year, the consultation will examine the two existing definitions of antisemitism, the IRA definition, uh, which is the International Holocaust Remembers Association and the Alliance, not Association, Alliance, and the Jerusalem Declaration, which comes as a response in a way to the IRA definition. And I, I would suggest that you look at these uh, documents, definitions, because they're very interesting. We will not gather people online and have them discuss the definitions and say, oh, this is good. I agree with that word. I don't think that should be here or whatever, but rather suggest some guiding questions. Um, do th these definitions uh, that have been adopted by many political bodies, do they help us, Jews and Christians, as people of faith? Do we need such a definition? Or do we need something completely different in how we address these issues? Is there mention of anti-Judaism in these definitions? Uh, does being Zionist or anti-Zionist belong to a Christian understanding of self? That's a very important question, I think. Uh, and, and that should help us move forward in our work as Jews and Christians in dialogue, because very often both anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, Zionism are weaponized in many countries uh, and in many conversations and prevent dialogue to happen. Uh, it, it, uh, happened to me at two occurrences when I was participating in a dialogue group uh, organized by the German Lutheran Church with ICCJ as partner and in dialogue with the Lutheran Church of the Holy Land, Jordan and the Holy Land. This is how the church calls itself. In fact, it's Israel and Palestine. And um, uh, very, very interesting work, but we, very often it came up that our friends and partners in Israel and the Holy Land felt that they could not express themselves in an international forum because the minute they said something about Israel, people said, you're anti-Semitic. Uh, which prevents any conversation and prevents many people to even understand what this is about. On the other hand, I, we felt, I felt that they had no idea what we as Jews in the diaspora had to deal with as uh, uh, anti-Semitic utterances that we hear all the time. Now, this is not comparing victimhood. This is talking about where, what are the pain points, the, po the trigger points of pain and suffering in every one of us. And, and that is something that can move the conversation forward. So this is the consultation. 
the uh, international conference, as I mentioned to Ron, Mark, and Alex before uh, you all joined this conversation, will be in Boston. Uh, dates are starting June 18th, so please save the date on your agenda. And because this is in the US, uh, okay, we have 20 minutes left. Thank you. Uh, the, because this is in the US, we felt that intersectionality, uh, which is a term that comes from sociology and political sciences, should be at the heart of what we want to understand. The word will not be in the title because that's a put off to turn off to our member organizations who will not even, I think, get what this is about, but rather how we negotiate our identities when we understand who the other really is. And I, I, the issues of racism and anti-Semitism in the United States right now are all over. They're everywhere. They're a constant part of the conversation. We, when we come there with our perspectives, I don't think we know or we know enough or realize, for instance, an example again, that all Jews are not white, that there is a fairly numerous community of Black Jews that subdivises in Black Jews, Black Israelites, African Americans that converted to Judaism, others that find that they belong to Judaism without converting issues like that. And so I don't know if we will succeed in getting a black rabbi to come and speak to us, but I this these, you know, many of these themes uh, will be examined, I think, in a very interesting, uh, way also issues of post-colonial perspectives, uh, where I think uh, with your perspective, you can bring us very interesting angles. So again, yes, it is about anti-Semitism, but ICCJ is not an advocacy agency for the Jews, <laughs> not at all. We are a unique organization of Jews and Christians in dialogue. Nobody else is like that. Uh, so we, we can bring that voice of dialogue where we examine and study and negotiate our commitments our, and, and enrich each other and enrich our commitments by the commitment of the other. This is what we are. So this is not the World Jewish Congress alerting the world on anti-Semitism. It's Jews and Christians together examining current issues in a way that is also humanistic. I know and I share <coughs> your concern about being inclusive of the secular society. Um, First of all, for two main reasons. First of all, I'm French. So I bring an understanding of secularity to the conversation that is very different from the perspective of all other countries. Uh, and I tend as a person to advocate that as president of ICCJ, I don't. I know how to separate the responsibility of the president and my personal feeling. I also think, and that is my experience, that many Jewish people who engage in Jewish Christian dialogue are secular. Uh, 
secular in a different way than Christians might be secular because we are different in our self-understanding. But many of us don't do this out of a perspective of faith. Some do, but for others, it's cultural, it's our identity, it's history, it's family history, it's things like that. We, uh, in some countries, we have rabbis, uh, Orthodox rabbis joining this, but not in many countries. It really depends on the member organizations. In many cases, it's more uh, liberal Jewish streams, but also many secular people. Uh, so I think that this is, people often speak about the dissymmetry between Jews and Christians in dialogue. I think this is one aspect of that dissymmetry. And I think it's very important that we be inclusive of uh, uh, secular people. One other reason for that is that where I live, the secular society is still imbued with the cultural, I mean, culturally, they're imbued with religious anti-Judaism teachings. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not go to church and, and have forgotten or disregard all the rest, but that uh, misinformation about who and what the Jewish people are, that, that is still very much there. And it's, it has trickled down to classical literature, to uh, so many, you know, paintings, iconography, representations that it's very sticky, if you allow me to use a very colloquial word. word. So it's very much there. Uh, so... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for a very complete answer to my question. Um, <laughs> I just want to ask uh, one one further question. Yes. And if anybody else has any questions, could they please enter them in the chat? Um, and we've got about mm, 12 minutes to go. So um, uh, <laughs> what what can we do? What can the ACCJ or or people involved in Jewish Christian dialogue in Australia do to inform the, the world understanding of the ICCJ? Well, first of all, I whenever, and I said this, this in my opening remarks, but I'm, I'm going to reiterate, when you mention that you live on the land of the First Nations, you alert us to something we are unaware of, should be aware of. First of all, because that is also true of other countries. Uh, second, because it, there is a much wider understanding than your historical, geographical point. When you, and I, particularly like Mark, the way how you put it, I promise to speak softly and, and walk tread lightly, lightly, tread lightly. Uh, that is something that I, I, that I, I feel I should take for my own in everything that I do. And I know I, those of you who have met me personally, I may not come across as somebody who speaks softly. Uh, I tend to be assertive, but because I'm so committed and I care so much, but in the way I develop my thinking and my orientation, believe me, I try to thread lightly and speak softly. The way I say it when I speak is something else, but I'm also I'm also not the screaming type. So, so, so I see some of you are laughing. 
if you want to disagree with this, Jenny, go ahead. But I'm not. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but and then you know, I'm a woman. I'm uh, trying to make my voice heard, and and sometimes that means uh, speaking out loud. Uh, but but I we 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 need to hear this, and also when you alert us to the environment crisis, uh, which Michael always does in his presentations at our conferences, and in a beautiful way, an impactful way. Um, it's not that we are unaware of this, but again, differences of contexts and perspectives and geography. Uh, we, we, you know, Europe is overpopulated. Uh, very cramped, submitted to uh, influx of migrants constantly in a way that you are less, I think, because... Well, because we have a policy of protecting yes, those migrants. But I mean, exactly. that's, not, that's not a good thing. Uh, no, I agree. I, I, I'm... You and I... I'm glad you said it because I wasn't going to say it, but we and we see the people living in Europe are making the same demands to the political class. Yes. Uh, it's everywhere now that and it it feeds on uh, it feeds populism, it feeds on populism, but it also feeds populism. Uh, this is, and, and I think people don't realize that that uh, that will be affected in a tremendous way by the environmental crisis Absolutely. Uh, in so, ways that we don't realize at all. So please continue to yeah. alert us. I, I should it. point out, it's interest, an in, interesting fact that Australia talks about uh, acknowledging country, but mm. uh, New Zealand doesn't, uh, even mm. though they have a much, uh, probably a stronger First Nations um, mm. way of thinking than Australia does. But, it, but mm. it's, it, it's an interesting case. So if anybody has any, any questions, to ask in the next seven minutes, please put them into the chat. Um, if not, uh, so what are you what what are you hoping for um, that that you that you can actually accomplish in uh, your your period in as a, as the president of the ICC? Uh, okay, first of all. Uh, one is never assured of success. Accomplishment is a word I'm a bit weary of, uh, but that will never prevent me from persevering in what I'm trying to do. Um, th this year, for the first time, ICCJ uh, has been invited as an organization to participate uh, in uh, wider interfaith international events. Right. I, I was invited to an international conference in Singapore uh, in September, uh, where I was uh, faced with the Asian perspective, completely different from ours. There were 800 people there. Uh, there were maybe four or five Jews. I kept looking for them at the kosher buffet. And believe me, the buffet was very generous. And the number of people that went to it was tiny. Uh, I learned a lot from that. I tried because I, I learned that. Uh, there are so many different religions, perspectives. Uh, I, I learned that Islam 
in Southeast Asia is very different from what I'm familiar with uh, in France, Germany. <clears throat> I, I learned about three different streams of Buddhism, about Taoism, about Sikhism that I see in the UK, but it's very different when it's Sikhism uh, in Southeast Asia. So that wider perspective, I tried to speak about the work of the ICCJ. I, I, it was uh, heard and certainly not disparaged, but not center place at all, <laughs> at all. So that, that was a great lesson of, I'd say, a humbling lesson, but I, I'm, if I'm invited again, I will definitely go back and persevere. Um, I Michael Trenner was was invited to. It's kind of hard, you know. You have eight eight hundred people around you, and they all signal to you to come and sit at their table. But when you start talking, they look at you like you speak a foreign language, even though we speak the same language. Lillian, I've uh, got one question. Yeah. And my question yes, is, yeah, how, Fred. Uh, from Fred Morgan, how are the yes. results of the consultations disseminated and used? And are they ever adopted by national or local groups as topics for discussion? They should be. That's the whole point of the consultation. So thank you very much for that uh, question, uh, it, it, it reveals two things. Uh, and by the way, thank you for writing to me. I know you, the person who asked the question, wrote to me after my uh, greetings in September, my Rosh Hashanah greetings. Um, the, the, we're, we have bottlenecks in execution at ICCJ. We have you know, projects of, I think, tremendous depth, not enough people to execute. So we always try to write something after a consultation, uh, and it's always sent to the member organizations. That doesn't mean you have to adopt them, but if you're interested in them, you should definitely use them as themes for your work locally if they bear on your local perspective. It may be that they don't, it may be that they do. I, I, uh, one of the consultations uh, was on many meanings of mission. Uh, that's a very important topic in Jewish Christian dialogue. Uh, we invited somebody from the World Council of Churches to share his take on that with us. Uh, I, it, that was a very difficult conversation. I think that is a topic that is very interesting for local member organizations to take up everywhere. Uh, because in no way is that conversation completed or accomplished or use the word you want, but it has not reached the state of clarification that it should have. Um, thank you, Lillian. I'm now going to invite Mary Marshall from uh, Western Australia to offer a, a vote of thanks. Lillian, you... Um... You were afraid you were too assertive, but you are just wonderful. I admire you so much for being able to speak in not your first language mm -hmm. so articulately. And um, Thank you. it's just been wonderful. I have made notes of what you've been saying. Um, the, the, the issue about anti-Semitism and people saying, oh, the Jews can always fend for, them, fend for themselves, they're strong. Um, and you rightly said, Jews and Christians need to address this together. And um, we, we are looking at the definitions of anti-Semitism 
um, at our meeting this Tuesday evening, as well as at the ACCJ meeting. Um, I was pleased to hear you speak about the 10 points of Salisburg and the 12 points of Berlin. I was in Berlin uh, when they were promulgated um, and they are so worth revisiting again and again. Uh, you spoke about the tremendous challenges and strengths for the ICCJ. Um, trying to find orientations that bring us together. So this is very commendable. Um, you spoke about the problem of social media and that what used to be said in private is now just gabbled all over the place. And uh, it's a very serious issue. Um, I, I loved you speaking about shaping our identities when we understand who the other is. It is so important that we Jews and Christians speak to each other at every opportunity like this that we can. It's so meaningful. Um, that we, we feel ourselves being shaped um, as we learn from others of different faiths. And, um, and that was very poignant about uh, many uh, being uh, secular um, and um, bringing their histories, their family history to dialogue. Um, and I, I see that very much in uh, the people I work with in our local mm. branch. So mm. thank you very, very much for speaking and sharing with us today, especially your your personal sharing. That's appreciated very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm, I'm so glad they asked you <laughs> to make this end remark because it allows me to revisit what I said and I'm uh, I'm glad it came across in a way that's meaningful to all of you. It's, uh, you know, the connection with the members, member organizations. Uh, when you asked me what would I like to achieve, I, what I first and foremost would like to achieve is to strengthen that connection. So I'm, I'm at your disposal. It's what I what I'd like to do. And I, I feel it's very important that we maintain this. It's uh, not just maintain, but develop it in a way that, uh, and, and a connection is always both ways. It's you connect to us, we connect to you. That, that is something I would like to achieve. Thank you. On, on that note, thank you very much, um, uh, Lilian, for making the time and making yourself available. I know it's early for you, so thank you again for waking up early to be with us. Okay. Um, hopefully, before the end of your term, we can you can we can do this in person, and you can visit us in Australia. I'm sure we'd love to <laughs> okay. love to see you here. Um, okay. Singapore's halfway here, so if you go there again, you're, yes. you're welcome oh. to join us here. Um, okay. uh, and before we finish up, I just want to take this opportunity for anyone who may not be at another event before the end of the year to wish you a, a happy Hanukkah and a happy Christmas. Um, for those in Melbourne, um, there'll be a Gesher launch on the 11th of December with more information to come soon. I'm sure there might be some other events across the country as well. Um, and information will be in various newsletters and emails. But uh, thank you again, Lillian. Thank you again, everyone. And let me on, on behalf of ACCJ and CCJ bring this event to a close. Thank you. Thank you.